Yeah, um, and again, you should talk to Doug and to Terry for reading Torah this morning. Um, as as uh, teased yesterday, we're going to do a little Ask the Rabbi now. Uh, Sukkot questions will go to the front of the line. And I thought I saw Bill Brook over here. Bill, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, okay, so you uh, you said yesterday that you had a question, so we'll let you go first. Yeah, well, we were... Um... I guess in the Kiddish room, Harris was saying he didn't have his lulav and etrog. And I was wondering, is it appropriate to go gather other vegetable materials and make a lulav when you don't have one at all? Isn't it better to make something than to have nothing? And what are the rules okay. surrounding the species? Awesome, great question. Um, and is actually a question, uh, for those of you who still have your Chumashim open, if you're looking at page 730, um, this is answered in verse 40, where, uh, which Doug just read for us toward the end of that last aliyah. Uh, so if you're not in the Eitz Chaim, it's um, Vayikra chapter 23, verse 40. Uh, the verse specifies, uh, mm for here that uh, you shall take on the first day and for us on the second day because on the first day it was Shabbat. Um, pre eats Hadar, the product or the fruit of Hadar trees, we'll circle back to that. Uh, kapot tamarim, branches of palm trees, the anaf eats avot, boughs of leafy trees, the arve nachal, willows of the brook. Um, and the, the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah goes through various derivations to arrive at how um, the boughs of leafy trees, Anath Eitz uh, Avot, uh, becomes the Hadassim, the myrtle that we have. Um, the willows are, and the willow and the palm are pretty specific. Um, and the pre Hadar, the Gemara also goes through a derivation to arrive at um, this particular citrus fruit that we have. Um, but generally speaking, what you end up with is um, a, a, an understanding of the halakha that the Torah specifically commands these four species. Um, and so it's not enough to, um, to just kind of gather um, a citrus fruit and three branches, um, but we need these particular species. Um, I think it's far enough back in history now that we can laugh about it. When I came to BZBI, um, so on Hoshana Rabbah, you need extra aravot, extra willow branches uh, for the rituals of Hoshana Rabbah. Um, and for reasons I don't understand because this was already in place before I got here, we would order the lulav and etrog from a lulav and etrog vendor, but we would order the extra willow branches um, from the regular florist who does the bima flowers. Um, why we didn't order them from the lulav and etrog people, I don't know. That's the way it's done elsewhere in the Jewish world, the way it's done at BZBI now. Um, but at the time, we were ordering from the florist. And Rabbi Yosef, who was, who was here for a year before me, kind of tipped me off that they seemed not to be the right things. And lo and behold, that first year that I was here, uh, we were in the sanctuary for Hoshana Rabbah because there was a USY group that was uh, spending the night at BZBI. So we had like an extra 50 teenagers with us. We used the main sanctuary. And as we're beating what were supposed to be willow branches on the floor of the sanctuary, um, there are actual olives coming off of these supported <laughs> willow branches and rolling all around on the floor. And Rabbi Yosef and I are like looking at each other, just like hoping that nobody else catches on. Um, all right, so we, so long story short, we switched um, the next year or two years later. Um, the next year we switched to a different local florist and tried to, and I even like was like, gave them the like Latin name of what the species was supposed to be. We still didn't get the right thing. And I insisted following that, that we should just get the branches from the, um, from the place where we get the, the lulav and etrog, uh, which is what we do now. Um, so, uh, Bill, to answer your question, um, no, it, it needs to be those specific ones. Um, the good news is that the willow happens to be fairly locally available. Um, so for those who got arbaminin from BZBI but weren't able to get a set of extra willow branches, 
Um, you can, if you're eagle-eyed, you can spot the right trees kind of in and around and um, snag yourself a couple of extra branches for Hoshana Raba on Friday. Um, Bill, was that, did I get to, to, did that answer the question or did I miss any question? You did. Uh, well, yeah, that's, but the one follow-up then, um, if one had the correct if you knew which species were which, is it permissible to collect your own and make your own lulav? Oh yes, absolutely. If you actually have access to the correct trees, you can certainly go and gather your own. Um, you know, the challenge is uh, palm trees, for example, are not native to our part of the world. So um, it would be, I think, exceptionally difficult to get a hold of a correct palm branch. Um, and, and likewise, my recollection from living in LA where palms were in plentiful supplies that willows were not quite so right. uh, available. And, right. um, you know, if you think about the kind of the, the geography and ecology of Eretz Israel, um, you know, it's one of the rare places in the world where you could feasibly source all of these things. Um, you know, not necessarily in your village, but, um, you know, the ability of you, your ability to go to a regional market and source all of these things in Eretz Israel is very different than, um, you know, to do it in a place like the United States where uh, the, the geographic distance between the climate zones is much greater. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Ginny next. There we go, sorry. Um, this is actually from yesterday. Um, in the uh, Siddur, it's page 202. It's what you sing when you don't have the regular hakafo. And it talks about all the things that you do on Shabbat and about two thirds of the way down that paragraph, it says they enumerate the four domains in parentheses of Shabbat. What are the four domains and why are they in parentheses? <laughs> Well, they're, they're in quotation marks, right? Quotation marks, yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, um, all right, so for this, we will uh, grab the Gemara off the shelf. Um, so, so first of all, the, I, one of these days, I will get around to teaching on um, the Hosha note for Shabbat, um, which is, you know, there's, uh, which are all kind of Shabbat themed and, um, elaborate on kind of all different aspects of Shabbat. Um, I've been, this has been rolling around in my head for a while. And what I found is that sometimes things like this roll around for like a good 10 years before there's actually a Debar Torah that comes out of it. So one day, um, but the answer to your question is in the very first Mishnah of um, Mesechet Shabbat. Yitziot HaShabbat, Shtaim Shehen Arba Bifnim, Ushtaim Shem Arba Bachutz. Um, so the, the transfers of Shabbat are two, which are actually four from within, and two, which are actually four from outside. Um, and uh, it goes on from here to say, so like, what does that mean? Um, and they imagine a poor person who's standing outside and a homeowner who's standing inside the house. Um, if the poor person puts his hand into the house, and the homeowner puts food in his hand, um, or if he, um, or if the homeowner holds out the food and takes the um, takes something out of the homeowner's hand, um, then he's liable for a violation of Shabbat. And it goes on from there. This is actually um, a fairly complicated mission, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but it's a it, that line, um, which in the Hebrew is poretet arba rishiyot b'shabbat, um, to enumerate or to uh, delineate the four domains of Shabbat, um, is talking about the halachot of um, 
carrying and transferring. Um, so we don't think about this much. Um, thanks to, I want to say, um, John Gradman, whose father passed away on Thursday. Uh, John's a member at Makora Bracha and he runs the Eruv Corporation. Um, so he's, you know, John and, and the team of volunteers are responsible for us not knowing as much about this as perhaps we otherwise would. Um, among the restrictions of Shabbat are restrictions on transferring something from a private domain to the public domain or from the public domain to the private domain and restrictions on carrying something more than four amot, which is about two meters, in the public domain. Um, what happens then is you put up what's called an Eruv, um, which is a, an imaginary wall constructed of wire and sometimes constructed of physical parts of wall, right? So um, on one side of the Eruv, um, the there are places where the bank of the Schuylkill River is actually, you know, part of the Eruv or um, where the wall, uh, the wall or the fence along the train tracks and so on. Um, and in other places, it's a piece of string at the top of, um, at the top of telephone poles that constructs a, a theoretical wall. Uh, it converts a public domain space into a private domain space. Um, as if, if you could imagine, as if there was like a fence around Center City from, um, oh, who just told me that they moved the Aru further south? It used to go to Washington, but I think they moved it. Oh, and I can't remember where, but what I heard is that they, but basically it goes from, um, I think, Fairmount Avenue on the north um, to Washington or possibly now past Washington on the south and the rivers on either end. Um, and there's an Eruv across the South Street Bridge that connects the West Philadelphia Eruv to the Center City Eruv. So you can actually go kind of all the way from, um, what's it, Spruce, is that Spruce Hill that's out in the 50s? Does somebody know that? It's okay, I see nodding heads, yeah. So you can actually get from Spruce Hill all the way kind of over toward I-95 and large spaces in between because of that connection over the South Street Bridge, not the Walnut Street Bridge. Um, so, um, so what the, the Eruv does is it constructs a large private domain space out of what would have been a public domain space so that you can leave your house, carrying your talus uh, with your keys in your pocket, walk all around, bring snacks over someone else's house for Shabbos lunch, um, and then, uh, and then come home again, and so on, without uh, worrying about transferring and without carrying these things in the public domain. <laughs> and that's about as good as I can do without taking a Oh, life. my Lord. It reminds me of a story I heard about this class that was asked to write book reports, and one little boy stood up and said, this book told me more about penguins than I wanted to know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the-, the um, Thank the, you. <laughs> the four domains of Shabbat is kind of like that. No, no, but now that I know what it refers to, that's fine. Okay. So, Rabbi, Wait, where's uh, the um, shared meal for the Eruv to be an Eruv? I learned in the early in this, in Daf Yomi, you need a shared meal somewhere. That's Eruv Tchumen. So, so there are different kinds of Eruv. Eruv literally means combination. Um, the Eruv that the Eruv Corporation has in Center City and West Philadelphia is what's called Eruv Chatzay Rot. It's an Eruv, a combination of courtyards, um, which is to designed to allow transferring and carrying. And you have a different issue of Tchum Shabbat, uh, which is not traveling a distance greater than 2,000 amot, um, which 2,000 amot would be about, wait, I want to get this right. Yeah, 2,000 amot would be about a kilometer. Uh, you're not supposed to travel more than about a kilometer from your home on Shabbat. Um, and if there's an Eruv Chatzerot, you can travel no more than a kilometer from the edge of the Eruv on Shabbat. Um, Eruv Tchumen is where you put some food items 
out at that kilometer boundary, and then you can travel an additional thousand amot from that spot because you've kind of claimed that spot. So if you needed to travel from your village to another village on Shabbat, and the distance was such that you could make it work with the Erev Tchum and you would do it that way. Uh, the third kind of Erev that is probably the most familiar to people is what's called Erev Tavshilin. Um, when a festival falls on a Friday or a Thursday Friday, um, the Erev Tavshilin is a thing that combines the time of Yom Tov and Shabbat and allows you on Yom Tov to cook food that you will then consume on Shabbat. And the way that you do that is before Yom Tov, you set aside two food items. Um, this is most commonly a hard boiled egg and a piece of matzah, although it could be any two food items over which you would recite different brachot. Um, and you set them aside to eat them on Shabbat. Um, and we would do this um, in Chicago where we had an in-house caterer, what we would do is we would just say to them, you take that one hard boiled egg and mix it in the egg salad on Shabbos and it'll definitely get eaten by someone. You know, that was kind of how we did the Erev Tavshilin. Um, and that allows cooking on Yom Tov that's on a Friday to carry into, or a Thursday Friday, uh, to carry into Shabbat. Interestingly, the formula the, that you recite for Erev Tavshilin um, in the formula, it says, you know, this will allow me to cook um, on from Yom Tov into Shabbat. And it should also apply to anyone in town who forgot to make an Erev Tavshilin for themselves. Um, so there's a kind of a backup clause in there that people are reciting for us. Um, Doug, you're going to go next. So this is, this is something I've been curious, curious about for almost 50 years. When I was living in Israel, I had a buddy who was a, who was a black hat, and it poor me got very very excited. Not a poor me, excuse me. At Sukkot, he got very excited uh, when it was time to go out shopping for his lulav and etrog, and he would spend enormous amounts of time finding just the right palm frond. Um, for him, the right palm frond involved finding one that had the tips that were curled over of of each of the the, the leaves in the palm frond. Um, he also had another thing about about the uh, the etrog, but I won't go into that. I was just curious: is is this a mishigas, or is it somehow based in text? Um, you know, there's a lot of mishigas that's based in text. <laughs> what what I mean by that is, um, the Gemara delineates what are the um, the basic requirements for the kashrut of lulav uh, hadasim aravot etrog. Um, and I have in my office, actually, you, you can find these in the toy stores in Mea Sharim. Um, they have tape measures that in addition to measuring things in centimeters, it's about a, it's about a, it's probably about a four or six meter tape measure. In addition to measuring in centimeters, um, it also gives all of the halachic measurements of amot and tfachim and, and, and so on and so forth. And marked on this tape measure, are the minimum lengths of um, all of, of the lulav, the hadassim, and the aravot, right? So you actually can like draw the tape measure out and measure a branch to see, and the minimum length is marked on there. And um, because Rabbi Chaim Na'e and the Chazon Ish have different interpretations of the length measurements, um, there's, an, uh, there's an upper line for the Chazon Ish and a lower line for, uh, for the grach. Um, so that depending on how you hold, you can measure these things. Um, if, if you deal with halachic measurements, it's an incredibly helpful tool to have, if only like for a visual aid to be able to say to a Gemara class, you know, and this is. Um, but what the Gemara sets is a kind of minimum threshold of acceptability or a minimum threshold of kashrut. Um, then there is the concept of hidur mitzvah, of doing the mitzvah with a beautiful, in a beautiful way or with a beautiful object, right? This is part of why it's important to decorate a sukkah and not merely to build it. Um, and there's a couple of things with hidur mitzvah. Um, one of the things with um, hidur mitzvah is that hidur mitzvah is, I believe, a sixth, um, which is to say that you could spend up to a sixth over the bare minimum acceptability for Hidur Mitzvah, but you're not supposed to spend more than that. 
Um, so for those who have seen the movie uh, Ushpizin, where he buys a thousand shekel etrog, um, right? Like you're not supposed to do that um, because you you shouldn't be overspending for your hidur mitzvah. Um, and this is a, effectively it's a price control. I mean the rabbis um, invent this halacha about limiting the the price of hidur mitzvah to prevent the kind of runaway spending that frankly does actually happen um, in some of the lulav and etrog markets in Israel. Um, but then what you get are different traditions, um, largely rooted in the Kabbalah about uh, wanting to have the tips of the lulav bent in a certain way, about wanting to have the bumps in the etrog be uh, linear in certain ways, and the shape of the leaves and the color of the leaves and so on. So that, um, all of that develops out. And for, you know, there are, for people who are conscientious about that or who have a particular thing that they're looking for, um, people will... Uh, people will go to great lengths for that. Um, and if you're living in Israel where there are uh, these Lulav and Etrog markets where you can, um, you know, you go there and there's a table of Lulavs laid out and you can handle them and look at them and there's a table of Hadassim laid out and you pick not just the pair of branches that you want, but the individual branches that you want to make up your pair. Um, you know, you can do this kind of a thing. And it's the kind of thing I think for most people that's like, fun to do once, especially if you go with someone who knows what they're doing, or um, when we were living in Israel, um, I think it's about 12 years ago, uh, Rebecca was studying at Pardes, and there was a, a, a workshop at Pardes where one of the rabbis kind of talked through like the halachot and like what makes it basic and what makes it uh, hidur, and then like we all kind of went and like went shopping once, like it was fun. Um, I, I trust our guy at Famous Atrogame uh, to send us good stuff. We always get good stuff from them. I'm not, you know, I'm not more particular than that. Uh, uh, Jeff, you're up next. Okay, well, speaking of Pardes, I was kind of half listening to a Pardes podcast about Sukkot, and uh, the woman talking was talking about the some parallel between the Omer and the Lulav and Etrog and the waving and the lifting and ascending. And I didn't quite understand the connection she was making. And then other than the fact that they're both Hagim, but, and then the, the Omer going from one you know, Pesach to Shavuot. But is there anything you can think of to help with the connection between like kind of lifting up or offering the Omer and then the Lulav and Etrog that we do now for Sukkot? Uh, no, but if you email me the link, I'm happy to take a listen and see what I can. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, Gary. So one of the first times that I uh, attended a Shana Raba service, it was um, quite surprising having not ever sort of gone to that and participated in that um, practice. Uh, it just, it, it seemed so strange in comparison to any other observance and any other uh, practice that we as Jews do. And I just was seeking more connection to the why and the, the understanding of the behavior and, and the, the practice of the, the beating of the, you know, the ground with these uh, branches. It just seems so, I don't know, disconnected from anything that, uh, you know, you've read or learned about as far as Judaic practices. Yeah, so for people who haven't been to Hoshana Rabba services, um, it is the most complicated, strangest service we have. Um, it's a mixture of the weekday prayers and the Shabbat prayers. The Nusach, the melodies, are a mixture of weekday Shabbat, Yom Tov, and High Holiday. Um, it's extremely difficult to lead the service because you're literally page by page flipping between these different melodies. Um, then you do um, the Hoshanot, so ordinarily on um, the the days of Sukkot that are not Shabbat, we would take one Torah out of the ark and then people would march in a procession around the sanctuary with the Torah somewhere in the middle. Um, on Hoshana Rabbah, you take all of the Sifrei Torah out of the ark 
and you make seven circuits around the sanctuary, doing all of the Hoshanot for all of the days. Um, and then at the end of that, there's this line, Kol Mevaser Mevaser Omer, the voice of the messenger brings the message and speaks. And as you say this, Kol Mevaser Mevaser Omer repeatedly, um, you strike the willow branches three times on the ground hard enough to make the leaves fall off. Um, all of that is... Or the olives fly, as the case may be. No olives. No, no, no. If you, do, if you, if you get the right things, as we do now at BZBI, uh, it's leaves that come off the branches. Um, so this is, um, it's based on rituals that were performed in the Beit HaMikdash in the temple. Um, and all of this time of, of uh, Sukkot, um, Hoshana Rabbah comes right before Shemini Atzeret. Shemini Atzeret is when we have the prayer Geshem, the prayer for rain. Um, and when we begin at Shemini Atzeret, reciting the line, Meshiv HaRuach HaMarit HaGeshem in our Amidah. So um, this is the time where we're transitioning into praying for rain for Eretz Yisrael, the beginning of the rainy season. And there were these elaborate rituals in the temple that involved uh, pouring water on the altar and uh, the Hosha note that we have, recall the processions that would go around the courtyard of the temple and so on. Um, and so <clears throat> with the destruction of the second temple and the creation of synagogue Judaism and the creation of the tefillot as we have them, some of these rituals were um, encoded into the prayers. Uh, now, Rebecca has just sat down beside me. I know she's going to whisper in my ear that it's very pagan feeling. Um, That's exactly what I was thinking. I know. But I embrace the paganism in Judaism. So what the, the last, what I'll say when we find, um, when, when we find things that seem really strange and out of character with the way we normally practice Judaism, um, often what that tells us is that there were practices in place that the rabbis were unable to stamp out and had to co-opt, um, right? So Hanukkah is a famous example of this. Um, there's this whole story that comes out of Migilat Ta'anit, which is a precursor to the Mishnah and the Gemara, about how they uh, defeated the, the Syrian Greeks and they went to rededicate the temple and they could only find one vial of oil and the oil lasted for eight days. And so now we have this eight day holiday and so on and so forth. Um, that story is very late relative to the time that Hanukkah took place. And we have records of the Hanukkah story from earlier in the books of Maccabees that are now only in the Christian Bible and the Apocrypha. Um, and the books of Maccabees are consistent in depicting the victory celebration as lasting for eight days. Um, if you look in the second book of Maccabees, um, it lasted for eight days because Solomon's dedication of the temple in the first place lasted for eight days. If you look in the first book of Maccabees, it lasted for eight days because they completed their victory during Kislev, during the time that we celebrate Hanukkah. They had missed several years of Chagim that they couldn't celebrate in the, in the temple. The most recent Chag that they had missed was Sukkot, so they celebrated a late Sukkot that year in Kislev, and Sukkot lasts right for seven days, and Shmini Atzeret is the eighth day. Um, and what comes out of that is the rabbis really didn't like this holiday of Hanukkah. They didn't like it um, because of its emphasis on um, what we'll call real world military power rather than a spiritual dimension. Um, they didn't like it because their world was in chaos because um, Jewish nationalists had um, cut, rebelled against the Romans. They wanted to squash that kind of sentiment and they couldn't get rid of the holiday. It had, it had too much of a hold on the collective imagination and so they had to recast it. Um, contrast that with Pesach where we know uh, from the ancient sources that there were people who continued to eat roast lamb on Pesach even after the temple was destroyed. Uh, the rabbis managed to stamp that out to the extent that now the two most popular entrees for Seder night 
are brisket, which is meat but cooked wet, where the Korban Pesach had to be cooked dry, and turkey, which is poultry, right? Um, but the, but the, it, is, it is still widely prevalent that people won't eat dry roasted meat on the night of Seder. Um, so the rabbis were successful in stamping that out. Here with Hoshana Rabbah, now I'm kind of veering into conjecture, um, I think that some of the water sacrifice rituals persisted after the destruction of the temple and the rabbis weren't able to completely eliminate them and so they had to co-opt them uh, into this service that comes on a weekday on an Arab Yom Tov but lasts at least at, as long if not longer than Rosh Hashanah services which discourages people from going to it in the first place. Uh, which I think achieves what the rabbis wanted, which was for not too many people to be paying attention to these rituals. Uh, we'll go to the Pollux and Rebecca for our last question today. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, is this sukkah kosher is the question. Uh, okay, um, can you give me a bit of a better view of it? So there's a fence around the yard. Right. Fence is more oh, I see. So what you've done is you've added schach over a pre-existing fence around the yard. Basically. Um, yeah, so this sukkah is kosher for a couple of reasons. So the first is the fence around the yard is taller than 10 tfachim, 10 hand breadths, which is about three and a half feet. Um, so that's the minimum height for the walls of the sukkah. Um, the space between the walls and the roof basically constitutes a very large wraparound window, um, but does not affect the kashrut of the sukkah because the wall is already well above the minimum height. And you put the schach up less than 30 days before Sukkot started, because that's the other requirement, um, is you don't want to have a, um, a sukkah yashan, an old sukkah, which is left over from last year. Um, and <laughs> What? But that could happen. Oh, that could happen. You know what they say? This is uh, one of my favorite jokes, right? You know what they call the day where the Jews take down their sukkah? Thank you for it. Hanukkah, right? That's the, um, so, but yeah, so the sukkah that you have here, um, we had a similar situation in Los Angeles where we had a porch that was railed and had a kind of like a, a portico over the top of it. And we would just roll schach out over the top of it. And you could fit um, about three people comfortably and five people if you were really creative out there. And we would um, have the sukkah there. That was how we did it the first two years in LA. When we moved back in uh, for our last two years there, um, we actually bought a sukkah that we put on the front lawn because that's what you have in LA is front lawn sukkah. This was the story I promised yesterday I would tell and then we'll uh, conclude with this. So um, we had the sukkah on the front lawn. And this is a good story about keeping your sukkah up for That's why I'm long. telling the story. So, so we I've have been to LA for sukkah. I've seen this. What's that? I've been to LA for Sukkot, I remember seeing that. The front lawn Sukkot thing is beautiful because everyone's out walking around, like it's very social. It's such like a nice feeling that you have. Um, so we had the Sukkot on our front lawn and Sukkot was over and it was, let's say like the Monday of the week of Thanksgiving. Um, and I get this call from Rebecca that says, because it starts to get windy in LA in the fall. I get this call from Rebecca that says, the sukkah blew over. You have to come home and, and fix the sukkah. And I said, well, I, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of school. And the whole thing. She calls me back five minutes later. She says, the sukkah is blowing down the street. You have to come and do something about this right now. <laughs> and it was literally like going like this down La Cienega Boulevard. <laughs> like, like a tumbleweed. But bear in mind, I'm like 35 minutes away. Like, why are you calling me? You're there. Oh, Dahlia was sleeping. Oh, yeah, oh, Dahlia was a baby and was sleeping and Rebecca didn't want to leave the house to chase the sukkah down. Um, there was a, someone's, someone's gardener grabbed it and brought it back um, and, and put like a, I don't know, he found a cinder block somewhere that he like put on it. Um, and then by the time I got home, so I, then I took the rest of the day off and I took it down. <laughs> Um, but this is one of our one of our family legend stories. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to uh, Harris, who's going to take us to page 148 for the prayer for our country.